So in the next few minutes, I'll be speaking on abuse of intravitreal anti-VEGF agents and to not make it too abusive, I'm giving a little twist to it also. So not all of it will be talking about just abuse, but maybe adverse use or, or and misuse and other variations in the use of the anti-VEGF agents. So we had this anti-VEGF resolution, which as we know has completely changed our uh, way we manage uh, many of retinal diseases like AMD, DME, vein occlusions and others. And the anti-VEGF agents are effective as anti-angiogenic, anti-permeability and anti-inflammatory factors. And these are the agents which we've already talked about, so I won't enumerate those. So when we talk of abuse, of intravitreal agents, it could be unethical or indiscriminate use for monetary gains, which is deplorable and hopefully no one or a minuscule minority of us would do this. What could encourage this is the relatively high safety profile of most of these agents, uh, the easy availability and uh, what could act as deterrent are possible complications, cost and high likelihood of the patient taking a second opinion before going in for these injections. The other categories would actually qualify as misuse or incorrect use, which is unintentional. It could be incorrect diagnosis, interpretation of data and investigations, or even judgment, which can vary from one clinician to another. To minimize these, treatment decisions should be made by ophthalmologists who have good expertise in medical retina, at least. The ophthalmologist making these treatment decisions must be fully conversant with the potential benefits, possible complications, and systemic safety issues associated with the use of these agents. So correct use implies a correct indication, correct counseling of the patient, correct procedure to be adopted, correct frequency, and optimal follow-up of the patient, keeping up with advances in imaging and results of clinical trials, Applying this judiciously for every individual patient, including the economic aspects as applied to that particular patient. And finally, of course, knowing when to stop. And that I think Dinesh showed us in a nice slide and I would just reiterate this sort of uh, situation on the OCT where there's marked scarring. And here we see on the color photo also, you see this scar and the autofluorescence shows us complete loss of the retinal pigment epithelium. So there's no point flogging a dead horse and no point giving this patient injections. This was again a little example of a case you saw recently uh, from uh, had over aggressive treatment. It come, uh, had the injection in another clinic. It complained of blurring of vision OS for two to three days. The vision at the time when he had uh, initial examination was 6-6 in both eyes, the fundus had shown vascular tortuosity and few retinal hemorrhages and a dull foveal reflex. It was clinically diagnosed as macular edema, but as we can see here on the OCT which the patient carried, the macular edema was really very minimal and only on the temporal side, the fovea was actually spared, which is the reason he had 6-6 vision. And the patient came with sudden loss of injection uh, a vision post injection of Zybev is uh, counting finger one meter best corrected visual equity. Imaging was repeated, which showed uh, evidence of uh, combined vascular occlusion. So you have a very upset patient. Uh, we know that this may have happened in the natural course also, but it would be difficult to defend given the good vision at that time, the short duration of symptoms the absence of good systemic workup and the haste in which it was given. So that couldn't the treating surgeon have waited and investigated and, and counseled the patient better? And following again, as one of the earlier speakers had also uh, mentioned, the principle of do no harm. In real life, the commonest factors causing incorrect treatment are actually wrong diagnosis, of the patient and the condition which leads to sometimes uh, over treatment or treatment with the wrong agent and inadequate, inadequate treatment for various reasons. As we all know, these are the various indications for which uh, the anti-VEGF agents are used. Neovascular AMD is a complex disease driven by multiple pathogenic mechanisms. And this is the way in which the anti-VEGFs 
uh, uh, act by inhibiting uh, VEGF and then fluid resorption. And uh, we know that AMD is a leading cause of severe and irreversible vision loss worldwide. And a more than 50% increase in number of cases by 2040 to about 288 million. Analysis of long-term studies has shown that most patients are stable for the first two years. At about 15% may be non-responders in the first year. The maximum dropouts occur between years two and five. Treatment fatigue is usually the reason for dropouts. Visual acuity then drops as the patient doesn't have the adequate injections. Around 10 to 20% patients continue to follow up and have regular treatment after seven to eight years, which the long-term studies have shown. And more of these seem to be patients with one good seeing eye. In bilateral neovascular AMD, only 4% were non-responders in both eyes and 31% showed a different response in the two eyes. Now coming to incorrect diagnosis, here, here we see an AMD masquerade, a 49-year-old gentleman presented with continued blurred vision in both eyes after multiple injections of anti-VEGF. And we see this yellowish lesion on color photo and increased hyperfluorescence on FFA in the late phase. And this was the OCT, the continuing injections are going on, not making much difference. And just the autofluorescence clinches the diagnosis. This was a case of adult vitelliform. This was another person uh, having progressively decreasing vision in both eyes, treated elsewhere for choroiditis with steroids and ATT first and received multiple avastins for AMD in both eyes. Again, no response to treatment, underwent multimodal imaging with FA, ICG and OCT. And the OCT showed dilated choroidal vessels and increased choroidal hyperpermeability. This is the other eye. And this was a case of chronic CSR. And the autofluorescence shows the hypo AF corresponding to the chronic fluid tract and the sick RPE here. This was a case of non responder after multiple anti VEGF injections. The OCT showed a double layer sign, and the ICD uh, showed again uh, polyps, uh, which shows the importance of multimodal imaging. And post PDT and anti VEGF, the patient did very well. Coming to the most important problem of under-treatment, an Australian study data suggests that only half of the patients diagnosed with neoavascular AMD are receiving anti-VEGF. So they are non-starters for uh, many itself. And then there are dropouts. And only 40% of those who started anti-VEGF treatment received it one year later. And loss to follow-up increases the loss of uh, risk of vision loss. What are the factors influencing this dropout? It's the burden of treatment, treatment-related anxiety, cost, travel time and appointment logistics, caregiver burden, old age comorbidities, fatigue, poor clinical response, and unbid treatment expectations, and insufficient perceived benefit of treatment. Non-adherence is statistically significantly been shown to be associated with inferior visual out, uh, equity outcomes and tendency to drop out occurs when the improvement plateaus. So how to counter these for anxiety and fatigue? The most important as a thing is counseling, counseling and counseling, because you have to counsel, reassure, make sure that the outcome expectations are realistic and there is a connect between the two. Uh, reduce the burden of follow-up and injections that we've already gone through as, as Dinesh showed in his talk of the various uh, regimes of treatment, PRN, treat and extend, and uh, poor response, newer molecules and combination strategies for getting longer response. In arbitral steroids can be used in cases in vascular occlusion and macular edema when you do not get adequate response with anti vegfs as uh, Lalit has shown. And in cases where there is a tractional element, uh, one may need to resort to vitrectomy. So here we see a good response post vitrectomy. Just uh, to come to the some of the newer molecules which are coming up, which may give again a longer duration of action for this uh, Brolicizumab is on the horizon, so we have to see, and, and that again, I think was referred to in the earlier talks, may give a uh, longer treatment interval. 
Uh, Abhi Kipar is again another one which seems promising. Sustained delivery uh, devices are being worked on and the Renibizumab port delivery system so far seems to be the most promising of uh, all these. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Cyrus, uh, for covering this uh, difficult topic uh, uh, very